Welcome to Raising Joyful and Resilient Black Children podcast, where we bridge conversations from parenting to child well-being and social justice, and we provide resources and tools for parents connected to research that matters to us and to our community. I'm Dr. Valerie Adams-Bass. And I am Dr. Sharita Butler-Barnes. Let's get started. Before we introduce our wonderful um, um, parent joy circle guests, let's talk a little bit about um, why this conversation is important for us as mothers, but also as professional women as well, too. It's hard to keep the conversation short, but I will say um, as a relatively new mom, new in the you know lifespan of childhood, I have a six-year-old and for the longest I was an aunt. Um, to my to my niece and nephews, my sister's children, and that was great. And I would say, you know, I'm their mother proxy. But having your own children and needing to build a circle of parents who are have children in a similar age, as well as parents who have older children and can sort of relate to what you're experiencing and tell you, you know, you're going to get to the other side. Uh, but also importantly, to have parents who could relate to my identity as a Black mm-hmm. mother, right? My identity as a Black mother, my identity as a Black professional mother, um, the decisions that come along with the choices I make about the spaces that are safe for my right. child. Um, just just all of those things are important. And being, in, being an academic means that there are times when we're in environments that might not be very welcoming, right? I can't sure. find all of those spaces. So having a circle that's close to me, as well as a circle that's a little bit further out, just means so much. And so when we were living in Charlottesville, my daughter was three, and one of one of her favorite places to go, which I love, is the library. Yeah. And, you know, I sent my husband and my daughter to the library when she had just turned three two weeks ago and said, you know, she loves the library, a newer library. Um, let's let's just take her there. Give me a few minutes to um, re- recoup and get myself together. And we had an incident with a librarian who pretty much assaulted my daughter. She grabbed her. At three. Um, at three, <laughs> at three, with two weeks into three. Um, and part of it was the community in which we're living and what was accepted for Black families and children. We were new to the community. We were transplants because I am an academic. Um, and But what I can say for a variety of things that happened is I was really able to call on a community of other parents, both um, non-Black and Black, near and far, who rallied around our daughter who rallied around myself and my husband to help us to process that, you know, racialized incident, if you will, to help us to, you know, make her feel okay, make her feel safe as we were dealing with, you know, the trauma of addressing this issue. And, you know, the brighter side even to that is that she still loves the library. Um, We still go to the library minus COVID, (laughs) But, you know, that made me also say that is why this community needs a Children's mm-hmm. Defense Fund Freedom School. That's and that right. Children's Defense Fund Freedom School is currently active in the Charlottesville community four and a half years down the line. Um, so it was a moment of, insta- of support for my child, but also support for other Black children. So we need these spaces where we can come together and figure out what is safe and how we protect our children. Yeah, yeah. I think mine is for um, very similar to you. So I'm a mother of two black girls, 16 years old. Wonderful. Got a lot of teenage years. And <laughs> then, right. And then an 11 year old. And so I always wanted a space where we can have parents from, you know, because black folks are not a monolith in terms of hearing different perspectives around parenting, um, sharing ideas and resources, but really being in a space that was very supportive. And then the academic me as a developmental psychologist, as we both are, um, loves this because I always wanted to translate what I do in academia to the community. So to be on this space and to be able to have conversations with parents that are sort of going through the same um, um, incidences as we are, to have these authentic conversations, I think is wonderful. Like I always tell folks, people in the community are not reading journal articles. They not read right. articles, right? <laughs> so They're not reading journal articles. They are not, they are not doing at that all. at all. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it is the space of being a parent. This is why I'm so excited for today's conversation. And then also um, the academic piece. And then we are both academics, which means we know how to 
use facts and knowledge and statistics. Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. we can really talk about the yeah. strengths of Black families. Absolutely. Yes, I, I just... Absolutely. I, I super love that part. And, yeah. and the reason that I love that part is because um, oftentimes the sort of model programs and the model, I, you know, the idealistic behavior for children, the idealistic intervention, the idealistic program and sort of stair steps that they recommend for children are not the programs that you or I research or our colleagues. They're not the programs that are, right. are often, they're not the programs that are best for our children. And so I love that we're able to be parents ourselves, to talk to other parents who are across the childhood spectrum. Our children are all different ages. So at least between the two of us, we have a six-year-old, 11-year-old, and a 16-year-old. We're going to hear from the rest of our That's parents right. you know, right. about where their children are. And so when they, you know, when you're in a school or, in, or someone in your community recommends a program, you know, we have the ability as researchers to talk about and contextualize, you know, whether or not that program That's right. sort of fits the bill or is there something else that you could do or someone else that we can talk to to help not just those of us in our parent joy circle who can help us with the conversation, right. but other parents who are listening in. So super excited to yes. have this conversation on a regular basis. That's right. So now we get <laughs> our parent joy circle. Yeah, um, let's bring in the joy. Yeah, let's bring in the joy. And so um, today on the show, we're very excited to introduce to you some of the members of our joy circle. Hello, ladies. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. See that? We already have diversity already. Listen to that choir of hello. Can we get that one more time? <laughs> Welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. Beautiful. Love it. Love it. Love it. And so I want you all to briefly introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit. And, and the age of your child will be great. And just, um, yeah, so just start off briefly introducing yourselves because we have a rich discussion we're going to get into today. And I'm really excited. And so um, how about um, Lynn? Can you tell us about yourself? Intr okay. Please introduce yourself. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barnes and Dr. Bass. Uh, my name is Lynn Henry Roach, and I'm bringing greetings from Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm originally from Haiti, but raised in the United States. So we'll get into culture. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> sure. yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I'm married and I'm a proud mother of two children. I have a 22-year-old son in college, and I have a 16-year-old teenage daughter. Oh, that's fun. So <laughs> okay. we're going to get into the teen years as yes. well. Yes, um, yes. On a professional level, um, I'm an author, an educator, and a business owner, and I do volunteer work in the community. And I recently founded a nonprofit organization to bring educational technology to schools in Haiti and in the U.S. So oh, I, awesome. I love community. I love doing humanitarian things, and I'm very strong advocate for education for all. Fantastic. Thank you, Lynn. What's the best part? What do you remember? What's the joyful part of parenting for you? Well, when my children get to a space where they're able to say, mom, thank you. Hmm. They appreciate oh, you. I love it. Oh, wow. They, love it. they love recognize um, your efforts mm -hmm. and they want to emulate it. You know, um, they're able to successfully navigate things that you said, be patient. It'll come. And then to mm -hmm. see the realization of their hard work. Awesome. Um, it's not easy. Every day you have, you know, parenting is a 24 hour job, seven days a week, a forever job. You never get, to, you know, to say I'm retiring from parenting. Doesn't happen. Right. That's like right. I tell my yeah. kids, you know, you'll, I'll be a hundred and you'll be 57 or whatever, and I'll still be your mom. That's <laughs> it. Yeah. That's it. Thanks, Lynn. We appreciate you. And thanks for being a part of our parent joy circle. My pleasure. Okay. How about Sharon? Hello. Hey. Hey, Sharon. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Sharon. Hi. No problem. I'm happy to be here. So um, I am a, mo a mother uh, to a three-year-old son, um, Isaiah, and um, who definitely keeps me very uh, busy, but I love him to death. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'm also a elementary school counselor. So oh. I'm just so happy to be on this podcast with all of you all. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And what's your favorite joyful thing about parenting or your most joyful thing about your three-year-old son? Wow. There's so many things that bring me joy um, with him. I mean, it's 
it's just so much. Uh, definitely his, his smile and his just personality. He's he's <laughs> just full of joy and he 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 makes everybody happy. Honestly, um, so yes, definitely um, been a blast being his mom and in this being on this motherhood journey. Thank you. Awesome. Well, welcome aboard awesome. the Joy Crew. That's Thanks it. so much. Yeah. <laughs> Tanika. Hello. Um, well, I am Tanika and I am a blogger, a micro-influencer, writer, and I am also a homeschool mom to two neurodivergent boys. Um, we are currently um, in North Carolina. I've always homeschooled them. So um, I personally don't have like the parent traditional school experience, Mm -hmm. but I am actively reflecting a lot on and, you know, helping my other friends just navigate the current school experience and then also advocating and educating as far as um, our homeschool experience goes. (laughs) And so thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Tanika. Go ahead, Sharita. Yeah, I wanted to say just for our audience, can you define what neurodivergent is? Okay, sure. So for us, um, neurodivergent is a vast and ever growing spectrum of the intricacies of the brain makeup and how that reflects into learning behavior social cues, understanding social norms, um, memory, things of that sort. So as far as diagnoses that reflect this, um, my, well, both of my children are on the spectrum. They both have autism spectrum disorder and are currently classified as high functioning. Um, And I say currently classified because I think, especially in my, the beginning of my journey, that is kind of like what the goal was to get them to high functioning. And um, if I could go back and tell myself or tell any other mom, I would just tell them that your goal is to be your best right here. Um, So um, both of them are on the autism spectrum. Both of them have what's called attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. And then my oldest has, which was completely new to me, um, dysgraphia, and then my youngest has dyslexia. Mm, okay. So they are both three, three times. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for that. I just, you know, yes. it's the, you know, this space is also making sure that we have all the knowledge that others have. And so explaining mm-hmm. what neurodivergent is, is very helpful for us and for the audience as well, too. And so Valerie, I think you was going to ask her that question that you've been asking everybody about what's the most. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. So I had two questions for you. I was going to say, tell us their ages and also tell us what's the joyful part of having two boys. Okay. So um, they are very newly six and eight. Oh. I have missed about their ages quite a few times and have gotten checked very quickly. Um, they are no longer five and seven. Please don't say that out loud. Um, they're newly six and eight. And oh my gosh, my most joyful part. I I really think it is seeing them come into themselves, you know, um, mm-hmm. and especially, you know, having black boys in this America yes. just be so uh, confident and who they are and what they enjoy, and their strengths, um, and just really, like, kind of supporting that, Mm -hmm. even though I know, I know nothing about it. I don't want to know about a Pokemon. Um, (laughs) You will learn. (laughs) (laughs) There's nothing for me. Um, Or, you know, my oldest, like, really loves animals, and I'm like, all right. So, yeah, Yeah. that, that's the part, seeing them come into their selves. Sure, Tanika, I must tell you, I have a daughter and um, as I mentioned earlier, you may not care about Pokemon, but one day you'll wake up singing the Pokemon or humming the Pokemon. Absolutely. Team. We have LOL bags, at small, medium, and large. We, we yes. got the aunties watching the LOL movie. I said, you might only make it through the first 15 minutes, but at least you'll know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yes. so, it's coming. Yes. It's I'm coming. an auntie yeah, too, LOL and I've got so many yeah. LOL stuff. And oh. people are like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't, I don't know what this is, but... 
Yeah. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so Pokemon's going to stay. Stay right where they are. <laughs> so thanks, Tanika. <laughs> Sharita. Okay, yeah. Let's talk with us. Let's see. I think we have, um, let's go to Desiree. All right. So my name is Desiree Tucker, and um, I am a wife to David, and I have a five-year-old and a nine-year-old. And we live in in New Market here in Frederick County. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a nonprofit called Women Solve, and I have had that nonprofit since 2019. And we bring groups of women together to focus on solving a problem. That's why it's called Women Solve. So we focus on one issue at a time and tackle that and see it through. Awesome. So that's me. Thank you. Happy to be here with you all. Thank you. Great, great, great. Lately, because again, you know, parenthood does not come with a manual and um, at all. I am <laughs> at all. And, um, you know, going through everything with my oldest, you know, you, you experience that first and then the youngest kind of benefits from that learned wisdom. Um, you know, I am, for myself, I'm, I'm enjoying when he's you know, coming to me with an issue, we discuss his day every day, as well as I do with the five-year-old, but coming to me with an issue and feeling like, okay, I actually gave some good advice. Like maybe I could do this. Mm-hmm. Um, that is, that's a, that's a joyful moment. And to see, you know, the light bulbs go off and, and to see, you know, advice that I give work because very often as a parent, Um, you know, I go around feeling like I'm just completely unqualified for this. I can't believe they let me have these two children (laughs) and, you know, walk out of the hospital with them at all. But, um, so, so that I find joy, I find joy in being able to, to help them and feeling like I'm, I'm guiding and and doing the right thing. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Awesome. Yes. Yes. That's good stuff. We've got lots of boys in this room. Lots of boys in this room. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. now we have, I think, Yawande. Okay. So my name is Yawande Oladende, and um, I'm a, I, I live in Frederick, Maryland. I have mm-hmm. two boys, ages nine and five, and um, I am a public health professional, and I'm also involved in the community, doing a bunch of different things in the community. Um, yeah, that, that, well, I was born in Nigeria and I grew up in Nigeria, uh, and I moved to the U S for college. So I'm a Nigerian immigrant mother. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tell us what's the most joyful part of having those two so, a parenting. Oh, <laughs> um, I think it was, well, someone said it earlier that, you know, parenting doesn't come with a manual. I wish it did, but it doesn't. Right. That's right. Um, said that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the joyful part is, you know, many times I feel like I don't even know what I'm doing, but, you know, it's the, the joyful part is when I see them, you know, taking some of the lessons they've been taught and you actually see them, you know, doing things that you were like, okay, when I was talking to you about this, I didn't real, I didn't think you were listening. I didn't even think you were taking any of this in. And then yeah. you see them outside and they're beginning to exhibit those behaviors you've been trying to instill in them from a young age. And you're like, oh, okay, I guess something is working. Something is um, sticking. So that's one of the joyful parts. Another one is just even just seeing how they're growing you know, from being a baby to, you know, now that they're able to do things on their own. And sometimes they're like, oh, I can do it by myself. I don't need you. Even though you're proud of me sometimes, <laughs> like, okay, I wish you still needed me like that. But at the right. same time, I've seen them evolving and becoming more and more independent. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And what I love about everyone's joy and what you're sharing, even I just recall Lynn saying, you know, she has a 22 year old and this idea that they get to the point of saying thank you. Right. So maybe yes. at five or four or three, they may not have that robust thank you. They may have that thank you in the moments. Um, and then, you know, the, there's the teen years. Um, we can talk about that on two or three more pack exactly. <laughs> episodes. Right. However, this idea that we're able to, one, admit that we don't know everything, Mm -hmm. right, to that, um, the joy, right? And that's what we want to make sure that we, you know, as we move along and and hear from you, and sometimes you might suggest a conversation, 
that we are also able to take a moment to reflect, right? To say, what is the joyful part? Because it doesn't come with a manual. There are days where we really are like, this was a, this maybe felt like a parenting fail, or I really don't know if this is going to work. So the ability to uh, bring into this conversation with each other, as well Mm -hmm. as other Black parents, the joy of the experience, and then the diversity, right? We have folks who are, we're not all in the same state. (laughs) You know, we don't all have the same upbringing, but we all identify as Black, part of the diaspora, you know, part of the the global identity. And we are all parents trying to do the best we can. And I love, you know, Tanika, what you said about, you know, homeschooling and not having a traditional experience, having young children and those others who can relate. Right now, another thing, anyone who's had a young child since 2019 has had a traditional educational experience. That's right. And that just might be good. (laughs) To be quite honest, right? So this idea, you know, and I get the homeschool. You know, my sister has done that with my niece and nephews who I used to say were my children. Uh, But really to, to think about my daughter's first formal enrollment school was, you know, so virtual, right? So what does that mean to her? And then, Mm -hmm. you know, all the adjustments and challenges on top of what we were already navigating as Black parents. So thank you for your blog and for your space and sharing that experience. Because right about now, those of us who didn't have children who had had the traditional educational experience, we're still navigating how to help our children um, capture and also to how to have this village, right? Where my, my friends who had older children would say, Oh, you know, you'll meet parents at the swamps and we drop her at the door. We got to go. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, right. We can't come into the building. Right. We spraying our hands. We wiping our feet. I don't know them. They don't know me. You yeah. know, so this idea of how you would normally build community yeah. intentionally and purposefully in the quote unquote traditional model for those of us who had three or, two, you know, four, two year olds is a different world. So we are going to talk about all of that. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to contextualize that. You know, Sharita and I tend to do research with preteens or adolescents, That's right. um, but we certainly will pull on the research of our colleagues and others around, you know, all of these stages and phases of childhood and really elevating, mm-hmm. you know, who we are as a group. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And so let's get into it now, y'all. So I want us, well, I want us as well, but you all to discuss why you joined the Parent Joy Circle. What were some of the reasons why you all joined? I feel like we, um, especially kind of in the last two, three years, have kind of seen like this whole Black joy, almost like a movement, you know? Um, You know, we got hashtag Black Boy Joy, hashtag Black Girl Magic, and um, I don't know if y'all have seen like Black men frolicking um, and things like that. Um, I I had a friend tell me, she was just like, do you think that you, you ever think that you right now, like raising free Black boys, you are mm. absolutely living your ancestors' wildest dreams. Um, and so I never want to see this in. I want Black joy to be this vast spectrum. I want to to exude in, you know, more than a hashtag and more than a sweatshirt. And I, if I, you know, could be so honored, just want to be a tiny representation of it. But I also want to be a a, like a pusher (laughs) of this movement at all and just encourage people to almost seek it with abandon, like get that joy um, and keep it and hold it and share it. Um, and let that be, you know, your act of resistance. Mm. Mm-hmm. As a parent who has an older black boy, my son is 22. He's in college, soon to be 23. Um, I remember he was, he's a millennium baby. He was born 2000, the year 2000. And I just remember reading articles about how they were building the prison pipeline mm. uh, for my child, black boys, brown boys. And I that time pregnant with him within the first year or two years of his life, I made that solemn commitment to him, my husband and I, that we would not let him be in that pipeline. So no matter what we had to do, we would make sure he excelled, that he had an enriched environment, that we challenged him, that we gave him a sense of self-esteem and pride, and that he would not be that statistic that they were trying to make my child a part of their system, they, whomever they may be. Hmm. That as Mm -hmm. a Black boy and being a Black man, 
at some point he had to, you know, come from infant to toddler to being in preschool to going into elementary school, going through adolescence, now in college to find himself and to make his way in this world. So the challenge is constant at each level, at each stage of development, that you have to be um, purposeful Mm -hmm. in terms of what your child is able to help them be in an environment that will allow them to, you know, foster success and, and be secure. You know, and then we went through that terrible time for the last, what, you know, five, eight, 10 years that we're seeing repeatedly on television, the violence against black men and black yeah. women in this country, watching it before our very eyes, not needing to be there, but seeing it and yeah. can't unsee and unhear what we know yeah. um, to, to raise a black child in this environment, the school shootings, the violence, you know. It's, it's hard conversations. It's the challenge mm-hmm. is not just, oh, I'm going to raise a kid. It's like, I'm going to raise a kid in this environment. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I completely and wholeheartedly agree with you, Lynn. And in fact, the reason that I homeschool um, when I was pregnant with my oldest, you know, like we just found out it was a boy, you know, and Mike Brown was murdered. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't even know like joy could be wretched from you like that. Like I was just like angry, you know? Um, and after, you know, it, it was really just like months. I, I made the commitment that, you know, this, as long as this child was with me, the child would be free and this child would be safe. And it's, you know, part of my platform now to be really intentional about making the memories, celebrating the small. And again, just seeking that unabashed joy, um, without hesitation or pause. And like you said, like being just incredibly intentional about it. That's right. Yeah. Thank you for sharing both of you all. Yuande, I think you had, I think you were, you wanted to say something. Yeah. I mean, I echo a lot of what the, um, what Tanika and Lean said already, because for me it was, um, I really wanted to, help change some of the narrative. And for my son, the oldest, the older one, I mean, he's nine years old now, about to turn 10 in April. But when he was, right from when he was even in in preschool, right, I was getting those calls from his school, from his teachers saying, oh, he's being disruptive, he's touching other kids, is this, is that, like, not a single week will go by that I would not get a call from his teachers. And at some point I was like, this boy is just three years old. What do you mean he's touching other kids? Like he's trying to play with them. And exactly. that was when I realized that, you know, for black boys, you know, they're so quick to label them, whether it's the school system, whether any, they're just so quick to label black kids. And you know, when I realized that, I was like, you know what, I need to do something different with him. And so even till this day, I, you know, I tell him things that sometimes I'm like, I don't even know if I'm doing him a disservice by telling him some of the things I tell him. You know, when George Floyd, the George Floyd incident happened, um, I t- he knew what was going on. I told him what was going on. Um, I showed him some parts of the video. It was very hard for me to show it to him, but I showed it to him and I explained the situation to him because I realized that I couldn't shield him completely from the world and everything going on in the world. Because when he goes out there, all they see is he's a black boy and all the stereotypes that come with being a black boy automatically gets transferred to him. And so I had to do that for you know, to, to educate him on this is what's going on. Even till this day, sometimes when he does, it does, you know, what he's not supposed to do. I tell him, I said, listen, you're a black kid. You should always remember that the same things that your white friends will get away with, you will not get away with it. So, and it, it really hurts me sometimes when I'm telling him these things, but I just feel like as a parent, I need to tell him. And so I joined this because in as much as I, 
you know, I'm, I'm learning. I'm still on this journey. I've just been a mother for nine years, yeah. <laughs> but I'm still on this journey. But at the same time, I would, you know, I'm hoping to share my experience and to also learn from other, you know, other black moms as well. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. And really what you, you just described really all of you um, and what you really just described is like what we'd like to 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 investigate as a racial socialization right. right experience and and that also includes you know racial identity racial and ethnic identity so this idea that as a black parent um that we are engaging and raising our children to navigate living and living if you will in a society that's going to other them and see them as less than because of the color of their skin that's right. right because yeah. they are black and there are other communities that do racial socialization but the experience is slightly different if not considerably different notably different from the experience of black children that's and right. so this idea that you are black and and people are going to treat you differently. And so as a parent, I not only have to raise you to be healthy, to have morals, to have values, to be successful, to protect you, to guide you, to discipline you, to correct you, but I also have to protect you from this racial system, racialized system that is going to work against you just because of your identity, right? And mm-hmm. so we do that in plain layman's terms. And sometimes we do have to make difficult decisions about these encounters that we either experience um, or these encounters that we witness, right? And and this idea that, you know, t- what Tanika said, I, I love you say, you know, you know, this idea of reflecting and, and determining as well That's as Lynn right. that this is not going to be the experience of my child, right? And so I, I like the, you know, that we are being really honest about how hard that is, yeah. right? That That's hard to do in this country. Um, I don't think it's ever been easy for Black people in America, but certainly at this moment in time is incredibly difficult. And for those of you who have boys, it's difficult. And for those of us who have girls, it's difficult. Yes. Um, and so what, what I do want us to also think about is in this difficulty, like how do we harness the joy in our children as we're telling them that you are not going to be treated the same, right? That people aren't going to look at you. And when we are reprimanding them, either because they're just not doing what they need to do or we need them to be extra cautious because we know that someone's waiting for them. Um, How do we, in addition to having these very difficult conversations, how do you harness joy for your children and your family in those moments? That's right. That's right. And what was interesting about it was that, you know, Yawande talked about an experience with pre- at preschool. And then Leah talked about all the way up into just how do I protect my son from the school to prison pipeline? Even you're still doing that protection now and it just doesn't stop. So you're talking about like a developmental span, like an entire lifespan of just this parenting that um, and these messages that doesn't end. One thing I, we have to be careful about, and because again, my son is older than you know the group here, um, I realized that, you know, all of this, a lot of this violence was occurring on television and we were witnessing, he was in his teen years, 16, 17, 18, 19, Mm -hmm. repeatedly, time and time. We could go through all the names of what we witnessed. And, you know, it became almost a paranoia over me. And we have to be careful that we don't project that onto our children. I don't want my child to be psychologically blocked and, and paranoid to think, and I and I'm I'm guilty of you know because I want to protect them so badly, I and I said to him and this is a mistake that I think you know I think it was a mistake but I said you know some people have a tar- I said some people have a target um, on your back. Um, he's a very smart young man, um, you know, graduated top of his class academically, high achieving again because I was on it as I'm on my daughter. And I want, I know that education is important. And when they can say whatever they want to say, but once you open your mouth, there's no denying what's in your head and what's in your heart, you see? So they can say what they want to. And then once, you know, you can change a person's perspective just in a conversation sometimes when they speak to you and they're not able to just judge you on what they see physically. So what I harness is to always try to uplift my child at every stage of his life. As right now he's, you know, finding his way in this life as a young adult making decisions, I have to pull back. Mm-hmm. I have to trust that he knows what he's doing and that he may make mistakes. Like we all make mistakes as we're learning, as we're going through this journey of life. But I think that the core value has been instilled in him. You sure. Know? Yeah. And he knows who he is and where he wants to go. Yeah. 
Thank you for that. Let's get to um, Desiree and, 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 yeah, Desiree, and then we'll go right on to Sharon. Um, so tell us why you joined Parent um, Joy Circle, Desiree. Um, you know, I, I joined because I want to learn from other parents and to share experiences. You know, I, I can certainly relate to what Yolande was sharing earlier. We have children of the same age. I was getting those same phone calls mm-hmm. in preschool and having to show up there, um, you know, every every single week. And um, that was stressful for me. It was stressful for my child. And as, you know, a, a first-time parent to a three-year-old, um, you know, not knowing what to expect, what, you know, what what was quote-unquote normal and, and, and not, and then also being very much aware of, um, you know, the fact that he is a, a, a Black child in, you know, a system that is, um, you know, not always going to be looking out for his best interest. But that's my job as a parent in trying to figure out and how to navigate um, the system, you know, and not drive myself crazy and not drive him nuts either. Um, so, you know, I joined this because it helps to hear from other parents and to share these stories and these experiences because um, we, so that we don't feel alone, like we're out there, you know, as first time parents and sometimes even as second time parents, because all children are different. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, it, it, it helps to share and to, to hear um, from other parents. So, so that's, that's part of the reason that I'm here. Certainly. Well, definitely. Thank you, Desiree. And that, that is so true. And when you, you know, when I was hearing the stories about, you know, three-year-olds and having these, you know, having to go to the school and advocate, um, and we clearly know at the prison of, um, you know, cradle to prison pipeline, it made me think of, you know, the, culture, Black culture, right? Which is not a monolith, as we've said, That's but right. we certainly have a, a, a way of communicating. And that way of communicating, even as toddlers, is not what is trained to teachers as the norm, right? So when we think about that, you know, the teacher training and prep, first of all, is limited for preschool te- teachers. The certifications vary from school to school, state to state. And so it's not even, you know, the standardized training that, you know, K through 12 teachers receive, which we could talk about that and awesome as well. But certainly what's considered normal behavior is not the normal behavior or cultural expressions and ways that we engage in one and with one of another, the dynamics. And so you have this othering, right? You have this, you know, this is not normal with mm-hmm. your child. So, so early because that's, you know, we bring our culture into these spaces where we work. And when your culture is not represented or you're not familiar with another culture, then it becomes unfortunately interpreted as a problem or interpreted as abnormal. Right. And so we see that um, we see that in the research, we see that in our own parenting experiences. So hopefully, you know, as we move through our time together in this podcast and we have guests and we have you come back, we can talk about some of those strategies Mm -hmm. and we can share and learn from one another and share with other parents. Like if you're having this conversation that our, our parent joyous circle has had, here's some strategies and some tips for you can take with you into the room, right? You can take these tips with you into the room. So thank you all for sharing that. Um, Sharon, did you want to jump in with your three year old? (laughs) Yes. So I, um, I definitely can relate to, I'm sorry. <laughs> the parenting Mom joy life, of a right? three-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mom life. But if I, if I could say something, when my son was about six years old, he was like in the first grade and he was in the after school program, not during school time, but the after school program, which basically they do a little mentoring, they play, they give him a snack until you pick him up from work. Uh, and they close at six. So mm-hmm. one day they wrote up a report to me about his behavior and guess what the behavior was. He had, um, put pulled his sleeve, his arm out of his sleeve, and he was flapping his shirt. You well, know, because I knew which exactly every what child you were does, about. right? <laughs> and and then so they wrote him up for that, and I said, okay. And I'm waiting for the what is the the climax of the story? And I said, did he hit somebody? Did he touch somebody? No, he was flapping his arms. I said, let me tell you something. 
And this is where you have to come in as an advocate for your child. When you feel that they're not being fair and just, I said, let me tell you something. Do not write up my son for flapping his arms. They're his arms, his shirt. He didn't touch anybody. That's ridiculous. Find something else. And I was very stern about that. And I never got another report about that again. And I'm sure he was flapping his arm, trying to fly to Pluto. I didn't care. (laughs) He was not bothering anyone. Leave my child alone. You will not pick on him. That's right. That was ridiculous. Yeah. And you had all yeah, these so kids, and this what, is what you had to write up. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I was. Um, I was saying. I'm sorry. Uh, I was can definitely relate to Desiree and Yuanda because I feel like I'm currently like we're, what we're talking about. I feel like I'm currently living through this as we speak um, because my son goes to a predominantly white. Um, preschool and I feel like I have to be his advocate. I just had a meeting with them yesterday and I'm just, I'm sick and I'm tired and I'm frustrated and you call me, it seems like every hour on the hour and it's like, I can't hinder your son. It, it It's just become very, just very frustrating to go through. And, you know, and I know that my son is very bright and intelligent and I don't want him to be like point it out and I and I feel as though that's what's happening in, in that school. So I really had to go up there um and 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 just let them know like what this is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. And keep advocating for him, and, Sharon. Don't be dissuaded by anybody. Yeah. You must yes, th- and that's that is what, normal um, behavior for a three year old. And if they don't know they, they shouldn't be working there. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, you know, it just makes me feel as though, like, I'm I'm going crazy. Like, am I, like, doing something wrong as his mom? Like, I don't know. And I start questioning myself. But, um, you know, it, it's just definitely a working progress. But I'm trying to stay positive and I'm going to keep speaking up for him. Uh, but that's really why I, I joined the Parent Joy Circle is really to connect with other um, parents and really be able to learn as well yeah. um, from one another uh, and, and hear other stories. So I'm I'm like, okay, I'm not alone. Other <laughs> there's other parents that have gone through this. So it just really helps me feel better because it it's definitely it's a lot being a first time mom and I'm just doing the best that I can do. I mean that's all we We're ever can alone. do. Be the we have to, we have to try to get our children. We have to also teach our children how to um, speak up for themselves and, you know, how to communicate. Like my child, Absolutely. when he was he was in preschool, the, one of the teachers and it was a, it was a person who was of color. Smacked him upside his head and he was like maybe two and a half, three. And he came home and he told us. And needless to say, my husband and I went up to that school and had a conversation with the administrator, Mm -hmm. with the offender, and made it clear, this is not acceptable. And you do not touch my child. Mm -hmm. And it could be someone who is of the same race. It could be someone who's not. We have to protect our children and we have to always ask them, what happened today at school? You know, what did you learn? And did anyone touch you? (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. So I I just have like two things I want to ask. I know that we've we've been chatting and I said we could chat forever. So one thing that I want to say is I agree, you definitely want to advocate for your child. And we also know that children have different personalities, right? And they can sense, right? They're very emotive at that age. And so, you know, they can sense and sometimes they may or may not, you know, be willing to have that conversation because school is so much about even preschool, about the socialization experience. That's right. So even these phone calls that you're sharing are about socializing, social behavior, social norms. They're not about he, your child is struggling to potty train or struggling to talk or struggling to, to color, scribble, scrabble. It's about the socialization experience, right. even through kindergarten. Right. And so really thinking about you know, um, thinking about that and, you know, moving those conversations, not just from a space of your child, but what kind of training are you providing for your staff? That's right. right. You know, so broadening the conversation beyond it's a problem with your child. So what kinds of training, you know, youth development or child development training has your, has your staff been provided so that they understand that there is a developmental spectrum, right? Yeah. There's a developmental scale. If all of us who've had children and those, you know, who are pediatricians, you know, there's like a, there's a percentile. 
and we don't use percentiles of development, but we do know that we'll say, well, this is typical or, you know, maybe they're at this point and they'll get to this point or they're right in the middle, even with the learning and socialization right. and that that expression, it varies. And so, you know, it's, it's advocating for your child. And then there's, you know, two or three causes. What kind of training are you providing your staff so that they're aware of the variety of ways that children behave and function at this age? Yeah. And I was you also going to say, Valerie, I also think, I mean, we have to have a conversation, too, about space. Absolutely. It's just yeah. every space is not going to be equitable. Every it's space not be equitable. is not going to see your child for who they are. Uh, Absolutely. And sometimes we send our we children to these top schools and they're just segregated when they get in the schools, regardless mm-hmm. of what the pretty flyer on a looks like, l- looks mm-hmm. like right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or the website. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes you just have to move them too because it's about space. It's about space mm-hmm. and training, mm-hmm. you know? Safe so space and training. space, that's yep. it, yeah. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's not even in the schools, um, especially for me. And even the, I, I can't even go through all of what I had to do to get my child, my children properly and adequately diagnosed. Like, and it mm-hmm. wasn't yeah. until we, uh-huh. find, yes. we found yep a developmental pediatrician of color and I brought in literally every evaluation my child has had and she walked in like panting she was like I'm so sorry I've been reading this and she was just you know I talked she listened to me I I never felt so heard by a medical professional um she evaluated my child and she looked at me and she was just like I'm frankly appalled that by the information you brought in and seeing him today then no other medical professional has properly diagnosed him. And while I had, you know, the aunties and the grandparents saying, oh, don't do that, and he's going to get a stigma, it was important for me to get all of the information possible to advocate for him and to educate him to protect and advocate for himself. Um, And so, like you said, it, it, it is... Um, sorry, like you said, Ms. Lynn, it is like a, a constant, you know, because as he's developing, things are changing, changing and things, you know, and while he, it might be, um, people might not see it as a symptom of something. And I have to be very educated, as, aware is a better term mm-hmm. of what this symptom is uh, a symptom of. What is it that needs? And then on top of that, training him <laughs> to cope and, and be able to self-soothe himself or even advocate and tell me, like, it is really loud in here. And I don't like that these lights are flickering. I don't feel safe. Um, because if I wasn't there and there was just, you know, a sensory meltdown, that could be perceived in an entire, you know, variety of ways that could escalate very, very quickly. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Uh, and so I think the advocacy that we we behave and also what we haven't said, maybe Lynn, Lynn started to hint on it, is the modeling for our children, right? Yeah. The yeah. modeling of how you manage and navigate. So even at three, you know, they may not be able to emulate fully or six or nine, but they are paying attention, as we heard earlier, Yawande say. So this idea of advocating for our children, teaching them how to advocate at the capacity that they can at the age they are, and modeling that behavior is so, so important. And then what, you know, Sharita is saying, you know, my co-host, this idea that sometimes you can have the advocacy and have a organization or institution that's responsive, and sometimes you don't. So you might have, as Tanika said, go knocking on multiple doors, or you might just have to make the decision that, this space is not safe yeah. for yeah. me and my family or my children in this space, right? And so, you know, we acknowledge that it's not going to be the same. And, you know, finding the network and the resources, one, to say, hey, I'm going through this too, as Sharon mentioned, but also thinking about, okay, if this doesn't work, if I've tried the strategies that I've heard in other places, you know, what kinds of yeah. decisions do I need to make now? And being okay with that, because as we've said, it doesn't come with a handbook, right? And so we do have to have these difficult conversations, but also, you know, appreciate what I'd like to say um, and started to say during COVID 2019, we've got to harness the joy, 
right? That's it. Because it's been so difficult. We've got to harness the joy. So we, what we started doing in my family, well, funny story. My daughter was almost born with rhythm. I know that probably sounds stereotypical, but no, we have <laughs> videos of her at like one dancing to Marvin Gaye. We're like, where'd she get that from? <laughs> like we literally have these videos. Then we sent her to a daycare center. And she came home like she was in a mosh pit, jumping up and down. And we were aghast. My husband is also African American. We said, oh, this is not going to work. So we started having Friday night old school parties. We were like, this is not going to work. How do you go from dancing to Marvin Gaye to jumping up and down? This is not going to work, yes. right? In these multicultural spaces. We were like, this is a culture alert. We have the problem with this. It was right. a problem for us, right? right we right. met dancing, so it was a problem. Right. So we got to the point, we would have Friday night dance parties, and she got her rhythm back. Hallelujah, praise God. But why I chuckle about that is when we got to COVID-19, in terms of harnessing joy, we would have parties and we definitely were one of those families where we were like DJ D nice saved our life. Right. So, oh, yeah. you know, she's making turntables out of the CDs. We're dancing. She's getting introduced to, you know, older or classic R and B and, you know, we, that's how we helped her get her rhythm back and keep it. You know, But we really were like, this is going to be our family joy moment, mm -hmm. right? Because it all, you know, we know what was going on. We know about Breonna Taylor. We know about George Floyd. We know about our family members, you know, dying in these yeah. you know, multitudes because of COVID-19. We know about the isolation. She was young, as I mentioned earlier. So we just were like, this is going to be our thing, you know? And so we, we did dance parties and um, that is, and we continue to have dance parties. I said, this is how we're going to harness our joy. Just we do other things as well, but that became our family ritual. We're, we're going to harness our joy and 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 that again was one of the ways that we said we've got to up the quotient every week. We've got to have some joy because it's too things are so heavy, so right? Serious. And parenting for black parents can be very heavy. And that, I think that's why we're saying is joyful and resilient children because there are going to be times where they have these interactions and it's a hard day, a hard week. But then there are times when we we've got to have joy, right? And That's so we it. love, you know, we love the opportunity to to speak with you and and to speak with the parents who are listening to us because we want to do both. We want our children to be thrive no matter where they are but we also want to protect them and that is that's that racial socialization that's the advocacy process for themselves us advocating for them but we also are like we we've, we've got to find these ways and identify and share the ways that we harness joy not just in ourselves as parents but that we help our children to harness that joy as well that's right that's right and i was going to say i keep going back to what tanika said about free black children and sort of what does that mean? And that's also part of the joy as well, too. When you always say that, like, I want to raise free Black boys to be and just own their own voices in terms of what they want to do. So I'm hoping, and I know that we will have that conversation and just this is what it's all about in terms of leading up to this and the parent joy circle and you all sharing your stories with us as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we thank you again for sharing all that you share with us this evening. We look forward to our continued conversations, the topics that we want to go further and deeper, yeah. the new topics where we're all say, I don't know about that. Let's find out. Let's find out right, together. Right. You know, <laughs> let's bring someone into this conversation. So we're yeah. we're gonna do all of that together. Uh, we're gonna be spending time with you and with our audience, and we're just super excited. I, I just, you know, I love to say, especially after we've had these deep conversations, let's not forget about that joy. So how are we going to harness joy when we come together? What's going to be our joy thing? Yeah, parents? what are we going to do? Well, since I noticed it's a group <laughs> of African-American queens, I like to address each of us as queens. Ooh. You know queen mommies. Yes. Queen mommies. I like it. I like you it. Know, it. Yeah, we are. We are. Okay. Oh, I you love know, it. To be a, I'm here for to it. To be a mother, to be a parent, you know, I mean, it's the highest honor as far as I'm concerned. You that's know? it. Whether yes, you've had it. that child naturally or you've adopted that child or you're just raising, you've, you've, you've become that, that parent to that child in the community. It's the highest honor because you are shaping a person. You that's are right. shaping uh, a mind you know, hopefully raising it with empathy and care and intelligence and and um, 
self, good, positive self-esteem. So it's the highest honor as far as I say. So that's my joy. You know, I used to, before I ever had children, I used to wonder, I always wanted children. I always wanted to be a mom, you know, Mm -hmm. and I I used to say I wanted four until I had two. And I was like, are you kidding me? Uh, (laughs) It's a lot of hope. It's a whole bunch of work up in here. I had the the two and and lucky for me, I had a boy and a girl. So I was like, bingo. I, you know, I hit it right off the bat. So I was good. Uh, but you know, I always wanted to have children. I always used to wonder, you know, what would they, you know, what would they look like? How would they be? And then once they came, then I was like, Oh, I can't wait to hear their thoughts when they're able to communicate, you know, at every stage, you're just waiting to see what it's going to be. Yeah. And so as I see my children flourish and grow, you know, a 16 year old daughter, teenage daughter, a 22 year old young man, you know, um, it's just every step of the the way I've enjoyed it. I mean, it's, there's been difficult times without a doubt, but I'm just looking at that little baby I once held. And now I'm seeing this man and, you know, this little baby I had before a little toddler. I remember how she used to sing around the house and she's a performer. You talk about your daughter, um, you know, who likes, you know, who came out dancing. My daughter is much the same. She's a performer, no matter what it is in the arts. I mean, she's very gifted that way. And just see who she is now and how she embraces it, how it's really part of her personality. I can play back videos. Look at you when you were three. You've been that way all your life, you know? So those are joys, you know, to see who they're shaping to be, you know, Mm -hmm. and that you had a hand in instilling that. So that's, that's wonderful. Awesome. So thank you, Lynn, for getting us started and for suggesting that we'll be queen, queen mommies, queen mothers. Indeed, yes, um, as we, our parents always circle mm-hmm. of queen mothers. Welcome to the circle, queens. And we thank you. Just excited to continue the conversation and just um, keep hearing from you all about the kinds of joy that we're going to share with one another and how we are going to, you know, revel in that joy as a as a community of this podcast that's right we just appreciate you yeah thank you you all thank you i don't have anything to add i I really like the queen mother i'm like on that i'm like oh the queen i like that i like (laughs) like it too yeah Yeah. well thank thank you you. thank you you for being part of the community just let's keep uplifting each other and you know not wherever we are you know yeah and, yeah. and then also remember, you know, we're learning from each other, but like the parents as well that's listening to this, I hope that they feel some type of, oh my gosh, I'm not alone in this journey as well too. So absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, thanks, thanks to our Queen Mother Parent Joy Circle. Thank you for the parents who are listening and to the aunties and the uncles. Go ahead and nudge the parents and tell them to join in to listen. Yeah. Uh, we are here, right? I'm Dr. Valerie Adams Bass and, and my co host, yep, Dr. Mm-hmm. Sharita Butler Burns. And we are here as part of Raising Joyful and Resilient Black Children. It is a part of the Alive Podcast Network. And this podcast was created and produced by Jacqueline Duje, edited by Manny Simon of Vita Productions. And you can follow, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure you're listening to us. Go to whatisblack.co for parenting resources and tools. And while you're there, you can sign up for our new monthly newsletter where you can hear more about these topics and others. And you can also follow us on social media on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at What is Black. That is What is B L K at What is Black. We're Dr. Valerie Adams Bass and Dr. Sharita Butler Barnes. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>